Coming up on Tech News Today, begun the Spectrum Wars have. Also, Microsoft attacking Google in Europe. And a non-war story, the heartwarming revival of Symbian by Nokia at Mobile World Congress. All that and more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Wednesday, February 22nd, 2012. Tech News Today is brought to you by GoToMeeting. Get better connected to the people you depend on for success. For your free 30-day trial, visit GoToMeeting.com, promo code TNT. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Aya Zaktar. And I'm Jason Howell. And joining us, host of the New Zealand Tech Podcast. I had the pleasure of meeting for the first time at CES this year, Mr. Paul Spain. Welcome to Tech News Today. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. It's good to good to have you fighting through the New Zealand bandwidth to get to us. We were talking about uh, Stephen Fry complaining, but you were saying Stephen Fry's on a uh, uh, on a metered account, and that's why he's running into trouble and ranting all over Twitter. Uh oh, frozen and pixelated. Or, actually, that's, or. A, that's sort of a pointillist. That's, that's actually a filter on path. Yeah. So maybe Paul's just a little ahead of us as right. far as hipster goes. Oh, Gonna plug into Skype. That's really awesome. <laughs> At least right, we'll, we'll get that all worked out because I think it's a, a ba- obviously a bandwidth issue <laughs> of some sort. We were we were fighting it, and then we got it right, and then of course, as soon as we yes. introduce him, that is Murphy's That's law of broadcasting. Goes. That is, yeah, or or whatever the New Zealand equivalent. Maybe it's I don't know. Yeah, Miralamu's law. Anyway, uh, T-Mobile is saying, you know what? Let's start a spectrum war. Yeah, since AT and T didn't get to buy us, let's go after Verizon. Sour grapes. In filings late Tuesday, T-Mobile USA. Uh, and, and also Metro PCS and 10 public interest groups filed complaints with the Federal Communications Commission asking them not to grant the AWS Spectrum sale that we've talked about on the show before between Verizon Wireless and several cable companies uh, in a consortium, Comcast, Time Warner, Bright House, uh, all part of a consortium that would give Verizon some of that advanced wireless spectrum that would be great for 4G service and T-Mobile, along with uh, all the others, say that that would be an excessive concentration of wireless spectrum in one company's hands. Well, wireless, uh, wireless, Verizon Wireless is already the biggest wireless company in the U.S. They have the most spec, well, the most spectrum, most customers. They have definitely the most customers. They most have customers. the most yeah, customers. Okay. Yeah, I'm actually not sure about the spectrum, yeah, no, but they but, want to have the most. Mean, spectrum. When you say biggest, you mean they got yeah, the most folks? They're, yeah, they, they they got the most people behind them. So on one hand, I say, listen, I'm a wireless, uh, I'm a Verizon customer, Verizon wireless customer. Uh, I I would benefit from more spectrum. It would make my uh, my experience with Verizon potentially a lot better. It's better that some company uses it rather than nobody uses it. You know, the idea of just unused spectrum bothers me. But what does T-Mobile want if they don't want Verizon to be so powerful? Does Should the spectrum be split up equally between all of the wireless companies that could technically use it? socialism? Right. I mean, it's one of the weird things with spectrum because it is a finite resource, sort of. I mean, you can you can free up new spectrum, but there is really only a certain amount of spectrum in the end. It's That's a zero why sum game. Companies sell yeah. spectrum to each other, and, and but once it's been granted to somebody, it's granted with the provision that you can make money off of it. And one of the ways you can make money off of it is to sell it to other people. Well, the mm-hmm. thing is, these companies tried to, these cable companies tried to run their own kind of wireless systems out there. I think Cox tried their own wireless uh, communications system, but nobody really was buying into that. That's one of the reasons. They went ahead and decided to sell this stuff off. And the thing is, I don't know if this is T-Mobile doing a solid for AT&T saying, hey, you know what, you guys didn't get Spectrum, we're just going to screw Verizon out of this for a little bit. This thing's only $3.9 billion. I mean, this is actually this is a drop in the hat compared to what AT&T was going to pay for T-Mobile, which is $39 billion. And the other, one of the bigger issues I have with this entire purchase in general is the fact that Verizon will no longer be doing a lot of the things that they were doing in the past, like moving Fios further and further along. They announced plans to get rid of that a while ago, but now since they're they're partnering up with Comcast and, and these other companies, they're just kind of labeling their services Verizon with Comcast. That well, kind that, of weird FiOS thing. is is not Verizon Wireless though. That is Verizon. Proper. Yeah, this deal seems to be influencing the way they are they're acting. Well, there's two different companies mm-hmm. at, at play there, so I just want to make that clear. Thank you for that. Um, Sprint said 
that they wouldn't ask the FCC not to grant the sale, but they think the FCC should look closely at the wider implications of the deal, including the provision that Verizon Wireless and the cable companies market each other's products in their store. And so that's kind of where you're that's pointing point. at, right, yep. is, is that Verizon Wireless now is going to be marketing cable service in Verizon stores. Instead of their own, which they normally would provide their own. You know, well, were they marketing Fios in, in the Verizon wireless stores? <laughs> they, I'm pretty sure they were. Now were I'm, just they? Like, yeah. I'm just thinking I'm like going to a mall and like yeah, yeah, we'll yeah, see yeah, double right. Verizon stuff. I did see double Verizon stuff. But but now they would be doing Time Warner or Comcast, mm -hmm. etc. And, and vice versa. If you go into a, a, a Time Warner cable shop or a Comcast shop, they would try to sell you Verizon wireless. Sprint doesn't like that. They also probably just, you know, they wouldn't mind. They want this kind of deal to be approved in case Sprint wants to make the same kind of deal. They don't want they don't want to have regulatory uh, problems when they want to buy Spectrum, but they would like to kind of, you know, throw a little block in the way of, of Verizon. Strangely, Sprint isn't coming out with, you know, with guns uh, blazing right now. I mean, the Light Square deal fell apart. They don't have the same kind of partners they had when it came to their next generation network. I mean, if they if they really wanted the Spectrum, maybe they should be fighting a little harder than they just got saying, lots of Spectrum though. And they don't have nearly as much as Verizon, grant you, but they they've got plenty of Spectrum. They don't have bigger. They don't have nearly the problems that T-Mobile has. T-Mobile's up against a wall. They have no spectrum. They might just try to slow this deal down. T-Mobile might. Remember, be... remember, Sprint has Clearwire spectrum. Oh, that's right. They and remember that Sprint's deal with Light Squared was to give Light Squared access to Sprint's spectrum on the ground. I thought they had a dual partnership. Yeah, with the, but... and Light Squared was going to give them access to the to the satellite stuff. But that's that's a whole. You know, Sprint was was the one saying like, yeah, you need to reach places on the ground that you can't get to from satellite. We'll, we'll provide that. Do you think T-Mobile's trying to slow this deal down enough to come up with the money to buy something like this for themselves? I mean, because they, they, they're they pretty much cash poor. They have very little going on for them right now. Is this is this a, a good motivation for them to try to slow this down? Uh, I think it just has more to do with not wanting Verizon to be too powerful. Well, what? I think T-Mobile just wants Spectrum any way they can get it. Sure. And, it, and that's less Spectrum than they have a chance at. Yeah, because they have fewer dollars to spend yeah. on it. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and once Verizon buys it, then that's a chunk that's taken off the market. You know, whether T-Mobile can afford it right now or not, that's a whole different question. But if T-Mobile were to be able to afford this, then, yeah, they would they would probably, you know, they, they, they would probably help go a long way to solving their problems. The other possibility is that they get together with AT&T and Metro PCS and buy it, and they all get access to it, mm -hmm. even if T-Mobile doesn't have the cash. Verizon buys this, they're not letting anybody else use mm -hmm. it. I mean, and, and really, that's, that's to me the issue. Spectrum, I mean, you can make the same argument for, for laying cable because it's so expensive to lay cable, but let's leave that out of it. Spectrum is uh, a, a zero-sum amount. And, in fact, Joe Biden, Vice President Biden, is pushing forward to uh, put a bill in to uh, make more Spectrum available for sale, to free up some Spectrum that's not being used right now and is reserved for other things. Uh, however... If you own the spectrum, you can keep everyone else out of your spectrum. And if they're doing the same business, should that be allowed? Should a condition of selling spectrum to someone be that you have to open the pipes, so to speak? Up till now, that's been the, it's been the opposite regulatory environment. The FCC has said, actually, with wireless, that's the one place where we're not going to make you open the pipes. Didn't Google try to put that in as a condition for 700 one? megahertz right. spectrum is that way, yes. That kind of thing seems like it's somewhat necessary to make these pipes kind of dumb. Let people have access to this. We can have more competition. This is one of the reasons we were so excited by Light Squared in general. You'd have a lot more carriers out there because they'd be sharing the same network. You didn't really care about that. Light Squared wanted to be the dumb pipes, effectively, to get paid for that. So it, it's I don't know if, if Verizon will grow to the point where the government has to take a look that they have too much spectrum. But, I mean, right now, this is the deal. Also got legal wrangling going on in Europe. Microsoft uh, today filed a competition law complaint against Motorola Mobility with the European Commission in a blog post titled, Google, please don't kill video on the web. That's not <laughs> inflammatory, is it? Well, they really don't want video to die, uh, that, that was the name of the blog post by Microsoft General Counsel Dave Heiner. It pretty much blew my credibility, my, my ability to believe what Mr. Heiner was writing with that title. Google doesn't want to kill video on the web. But they didn't say they said, please don't. And, they, and saying that just is, absolutely makes me not want to uh, go along or believe anything you say because it's just so over the top. However, they make a good point. Uh, in court, they say Motorola has requested. And remember, Google is, is acquiring Motorola. So Microsoft's already jumping to the conclusion that that deal gets approved. Motorola wants 2.25% 
uh, for every laptop sold with Windows as royalties for patents that they have on Wi-Fi and H.264. Microsoft does the math, points out. On That's where this whole video thing comes from, is that H.264 standard. Exactly. A uh, $1,000 laptop, that would mean Microsoft has to pay $22.50 to Motorola to license the patent. They say, That's not friendly. That is not fear. Or wait, fair <laughs> and reasonable. It's fear, but it's not fair, reasonable, and whatever the N and the D are. Uh, good question. Why, we should know this. We've talked about friend so much. Uh, but it's, it's basically the, 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 the kind of patents that... Fair, reasonable, non-discriminatory. Non-discriminatory. Yeah. Microsoft points out that H.264's consortium, which holds the other 2,300 patents related to H.264, charges Microsoft two cents per thousand dollars. So 0. 0.002 uh, percent. And uh, that's a volume discount that Microsoft gets. But you would never pay more than 20 cents per thousand dollars, even if you were a small player. So they're asking the European Commission to uh, sanction Motorola and make them license these patents on fair and reasonable terms. Uh, Google representative told Ars Technica, we haven't seen Microsoft's complaint, but it's consistent with the way they use the regulatory process to attack competitors. It's particularly ironic, given their track record in this area and collaboration with patent trolls. Ooh, so Google getting all, really? you know, catty in response as well. So let's leave out the inflammatory rhetoric on both sides. It does sound like Motorola is overcharging for these patents. What's the reasonable explanation of why they would do this? Other than the conspiracy theory of they, you know, they want to milk Microsoft. I mean, it, does Microsoft have a case here that this is not friend? Motorola Mobility was losing tons of money. That's one of the reasons they were being acquired by Google in the first place. So, I mean, if they're trying to, you know, milk their patents for some money, that just sounds like something they have to do to survive. Because for years... Yeah, but they still can't say, like, well, we're going to take a 20-cent patent and charge $22. Well, clearly they it doesn't might, matter how poor you are. If their legal That's representation is telling them that it's not... It, that it, it, they would, it would have to be that their representation saying, yeah, that, that works. I mean, it seems like a crazy number to do. How, yeah, exactly. I don't know. How does that work? Brand was not something they taught us in, uh, in in American law school. I mean, if Motorola could somehow argue, hey, this isn't actually a friend patent, you see. This is non-essential. But the 50 patents in question are. So I think this has a little bit more to do with Motorola saying, how long can we get away with this before the European Union says, European Commission rather says, no, 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 you, you can't charge more than what I think like the 20 cent uh, ceiling would be. $22.50 as compared to somewhat similar patents that uh, the other consortium is is asking two cents for is seems unreasonable. I feel like either Motorola just knows that this is going to come down in court and they're trying to keep it as high as possible mm -hmm. because the court's never going to say raise it. So you make right. it as high as high as you think you can get away with mm -hmm. and then whittle it down. Right. That's good negotiating. Uh, that's the only thing that makes sense. Otherwise, I think I'm missing something here. People in chat room, some people are saying, hey, it's capitalism. You charge what you want, except in Europe, you can't. In Europe, there are these frand laws that say you have to license standards compliant technology on reasonable terms. You, you just that's the law. And so either what Sarah's saying is right. It's they think that this isn't uh, standards compliant patent and that they can get away with charging what they want mm -hmm. standards uh, essential uh or uh or, or it's a negotiating then position. again look at the headline again google please don't kill video on the web i mean this is microsoft going after google google's about to uh get, take control of all these motorola patents google wants them to be as powerful as possible microsoft and apple for that matter wants them to be as weak as possible yeah i don't understand why microsoft has to go after google so hard with this when the 22, I mean, why say Google don't kill video on the web? Why why raise all that <laughs> rhetoric when your case actually sounds pretty reasonable on its own? It's just the theme of the week, right? I mean, they, they've been yeah, picking on right. Google all week for the past couple of, I guess, months now, this entire month. Google's been in, in a mess with privacy. Anytime that the word popped up, people freaked out. Microsoft's like, hey, we got something. And this has been going on for a long time. It's a series of videos, I mean, Microsoft's produced just to, mm -hmm. to rag on Google. The fact is Google doesn't even own Motorola Mobility yet anyway. And there's no plans for this to be like, oh, by the way, we're going to uh, charge outrageous rates forever. A whole bunch of stuff could change once this takeover is done. Microsoft and Google have been playing dirty for a while. I think Microsoft is trying to take advantage of what they think the public perception is of Google right now that people are scared and Google's too powerful and is doing terrible things to other companies. And again, I mean, Google is buying Motorola in large part because of those patents. This yeah. is something that's really important to Google. So, 
Google is about to wade into the patent wars, is what that means. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. We, do, we have not forgotten about Paul Spain. We're tr still trying to get him nope. back. Oh, I have him back. Oh, we do. We oh, do. Yeah. I was waiting for that, that signal. Did we oh, get him I back? I put right it in then? the chat. Um, yeah, we have him back. Mm -hmm. All right. Hi, Paul. Welcome back. Thank you. Hopefully, uh, you can stick with us for a conversation about Google's new heads up display glasses. This time, the New York Times is reporting about this. They said that Google's readying the augmented reality glasses for sale by the end of the year. Now, New York Times is citing, get this, several Google employees familiar with the project. So not the people familiar with the matter. Google Googlers employees. familiar with the project. I believe that. the new people familiar with the Who asked not matter. to be named. So uh, these are <laughs> nameless people. And the pricing is going to be about the same as a smartphone. 250 bucks to $600. I'm assuming that means something like uh, no contract there for $600. Specs of the glasses, same stuff we've heard before. Android-based small screen that's visible on one of the lenses. 3G or 4G radios. GPS and motion sensors and a low-res built-in camera so that you can use Google Goggles, which I can never say, when you're looking you just at it. I just have such a hard time saying it. I'm not going to say it again. It also <laughs> uses latitude to share location, so you can check into places just by being there when you're wearing this thing on your head. And it uses maps to show other things nearby, so you can just kind of look around and you'll be able to see things. Uh, the availability, it's set up like an experiment. The thing is, Google does not seem to have a business plan plotted out for this. Think more like the CR48 when that came out. They had a, like a pilot program. You could sign up, get the laptop, give feedback. Uh, and according to the uh, Times article, they're not recommending, uh, well, at least the, the testers are saying, they're not suggesting you wear this all the time. This isn't something you want to wear all the time. But they expect some hardcore geeks to kind of do that. I, I think the, the only thing that puzzles me about this, I, it sounds great if it works. The only thing that puzzles me about it is they say you tilt your head to scroll and click. That sort of makes sense. I could see where that would work. But how do you let it know that you're tilting at your head to control the interface versus just the normal head tilting that one does in the course of wearing glasses? Yeah, there'd have to be some sort of toggle on and off, sort of the same way that we've talked about um, interfaces that would follow your eyes and you'd be able to control your computer with, with movements of your head. But then what happens if you just look up, talk to your friend for a second? I'm not sure how they're planning to combat that. It does seem like it would be complicated, especially since there's also the idea of wearable technology, much like these glasses, that's more of like a watch or something that you wear on your wrist where you could wear like it all the time. Type of thing. Yeah, or, you, know, so, you know, something like the jawbone or, you mm -hmm. know, but something that had more of a screen where you could wear that all the time. So it's not like you're taking these glasses on and off. Because, I, I mean, at least the prototype that I've seen has kind of an Oakley glasses look. Fine, sometimes wouldn't want to wear them all the time. Wouldn't want that to be my my source of information that I had to take on and off all the time. Paul, you're gonna go trotting around with some Google heads up display glasses if you get a chance. Uh, no, it it sounds a bit odd to me, and the concept of actually uh, having the full blown operating system and so on built into the glasses. Um, I don't think that makes too much sense. They're going to be too heavy and unwieldy. Uh, they're going to need a pretty big battery. Um, yeah, I would think if 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 there really was a solution um, here, and it's maybe it's a solution looking for a problem, but if this is a solution to uh, to some genuine needs, maybe it would work better if it ties back with uh, with a smartphone. I wonder if there's enough surface area to keep like the processing cool, like on your head. I mean, unless it's connected to something else, if the processing is actually going on in like I don't know somewhere in your in where I guess these little arms are. That's it could get pretty hot by your head, right? I mean, it's well, like a if physical it, if problem. If it doesn't need a oh, lot of green. storage. That it doesn't need as much battery. Well, you need to keep keep ch uh, checking when you're looking at something. Like, okay, is that is, your, is that laptop, whatever it is, let's right. hook up a Google goggles and then... It's essentially a thin client going through 3G back to the to the Google data center. What about farsighted people? I don't, I don't read really well up close. I mean, how far away are these... <laughs> I oh, can't like, have is, my glasses. Oh, what kind of focus is it's the camera? It's going to have to have some adjustment for that. That's a good point. Yeah. yeah. And it's like a macro lens or something. Something like oh, that. Or people cameras. who already wear glasses. But that's, it's... You already can do that with displays. You can you can change the focus, right? But no. I mean, if something's up this close to me or even up this close, I, I'm not going to be able to read it. Period. All these problems sound solvable. Yeah. All, all of the problems we've said. Uh, some people in the chat room are saying, what about radiation? We're not supposed to hold our cell phones next to our heads, right? Just mm -hmm. in case. You're going to have a 3G transmitter up there. What are they going to do about that? There's also the question of uh, privacy issues, taking picture with your taking oh, pictures right. yeah. with your with your camera uh, glasses because people don't realize that it's a camera. I kind of say, listen, I mean, I could pretend I'm scrolling on my phone and be taking pictures of people too. You sort of have to get used to the fact that 
Sometimes this thing is happening. Says, oh, the, the thing is on. Yeah. It's recording. Just, uh, like an intermittent beep. Yeah. Just a flashing red pictures. light. Taking pictures. Taking pictures. Yeah. Yeah. Jim. <laughs> All right. Let's take a quick break and thank our sponsor. Tech News Today is brought to you by GoToMeeting. Online meetings made easy. Uh, you want to be able to look somebody in the eye when you're meeting, but that means you've got to travel, right? Uh, unless you're doing some grainy video or just a voice set, it's, it's, it's insubstantial. We're, the more we teleconference, the more we realize that nonverbal gestures, eye contact, all very important. And that's why we recommend go to meeting with HD Faces by Citrix, a simple online meeting service so you don't have to travel. But you've got group HD video, helps you get better connected to the people you depend on for success. And it just takes it. You don't need a bunch of special equipment. You don't need to fill a room with huge screens. You need a webcam. And, and do you have the ability to click? Well, that's all you need. Webcam. And you click to collaborate in a group with HD video. You can see attendees eye to eye, collaborate on documents in real time. And you get the, that sort of nonverbal communication, those cues that help build trust and confidence and make meetings more effective. Go to meeting is, as you know, easy to set up, easy to use. And the video quality is clear and natural it's like being in the same room with people available for mac or pc you can use GoToMeeting for product reviews demos sales presentations training sessions weekly status meetings all kinds of things that you need to see people's faces for and collaborate on documents and you do it right from your desk so check them out start hosting your own face-to-face -face online meetings today for free try go to meeting free for 30 days here's how you do it visit go to meeting.com g-o-t-o-m-e-e-t-i-n-g.com click on the try it free button and enter the promo code TNT. That's go to meeting.com, offer code TNT. We thank them for their support of Tech News Today. On to Sony Vita Day here in the United States. Happy Vita Day, everybody. Yay. If you have $250, you can get a Wi Fi only Vita. Uh, the 3G uh, version uh, will run you $300. But here's sort of the the issue that a lot of people who at least are, are looking into this, these pricing for Vitas take issue with is that Vitas require proprietary external memory cards. Now, those could run, depending on how much, you know, how big they are, between $20 and $100 needed for most games. And then the games themselves can run you, oh gosh, I don't know. I mean, let's say $50 just for, sure, for an average yeah. game. So all of a sudden, your 250 Wi-Fi only Vita is more like 320, let's say. So there's a hidden fees issue, um, especially with this proprietary Sony technology. Not uh, not new, but some, something to uh, cost take of ownership into is something you need to pay attention to. Yeah. Now, uh, director of hardware marketing uh, for Sony PlayStation, John Kohler, told CNET. This is because piracy is a major contributing factor uh, for oh, sure. proprietary you want to justify something, blame the pirates. Exactly. That's why I didn't get up on time this morning. Right. Now, you might say, hey, well, 3G Vita, uh, it's just $50 more for $300. That's probably a better deal. And Gadget had a, um, a nice hands-on video. They got their hands on uh, that version. And they said there's a lot of stuff in the PlayStation Store, not only a really good uh, uh, um, uh store for games, but also some apps that people will know and be familiar with. Netflix, for example, a Sony app called Live Tweet, which is sort of a stripped down version of, of Twitter, a Flickr for photos. Although they did notice that the 20 megabyte cap for downloads that had been reported the Vita would have also applies to Netflix. So it's streaming as well. That's over 3G. So that's something to take into consideration if you're going to pony up another $50 for the 3G version. So, I, Paul, I know that you were at a launch event uh, for the Vita a couple nights ago. What was the scene there? What, what, what did you What did you make of it? Were people whining about the price? Just dropped. Oh, Paul, darn it! All right, well, like I refuse to answer that question. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm out of here. Well, yeah, with well, that 20 megabyte cap, you know, at least uh, something in Gadget noticed. A lot of the apps that, that come on the PS uh, Vita are really small. The Netflix app is 12 megabytes, so you mm -hmm. can download it on 3G. You can't play any movies on it, which is kind of a, a silly thing. But I mean, it, the, they were saying that that was, a, and Gadget was saying that was a, a good thing about the Vita, considering that the proprietary memory cards are not backwards. I mean, you can't use the old ones. You can't use the Memory Stick Pro Duo, whatever it was called, on this thing. You want to make sure your space is used adequately. And so at least Sony made the application small enough that you can have that on there. That being said, at 250 bucks. I don't understand. I mean, that's how this around still the same price as like a PlayStation or an Xbox. Right, that's why the arguments of the cost of ownership was confusing to me. Because I mean, that's the same thing with you know console games. Like if you have a console, the game isn't free. You this don't have to buy memory though. Yeah, the, yeah, you well, got to well, buy games. Maybe arcade ones, but 
But yeah, so some of them, I mean, like let's think of the original Xbox when the entry level ones. Is that is that now four gigabytes or is it no memory on there? I can't remember at this point. Because well, there's, there's a so base many... model that that you can uh, you you buy the games. You don't need the memory to play the games. The thing with the Vita is you, you need have the memory to, buy, yeah. to play the games. What's also interesting so if you don't is... want to support the terrorists and kill children, you need to buy that proprietary memory. <laughs> also, let's think about about a year ago the 3DS, but Nintendo was released last March. And less than four months later, they had to slash their price. It started out at two hundred fifty dollars as well. They took it down to I think it was like mm, one seventy five. They had to slash about eighty dollars off because they weren't selling enough units. So this is the sort of thing where I would think Sony would look at this and say we could do uh, really well to I don't know price us at something under at least two hundred dollars. Thinking about the PS3, when they when Sony introduced that, they were selling it at a loss. I'm thinking the PSP, the probably uh, do we know if they're selling it at a loss? Actually, I don't. I don't have any numbers on that. I'm just kind of curious because they put some serious technology in that handheld. Consoles are almost always sold at a loss, uh, so that would not be unprecedented if they did lower the price. And when you look at the Nintendo 3DS having to have lowered its price, and you look at the analysts, it, it seems like Sony is saying, you know what, we just want to milk. All of the people we know will pay full price because they're Sony fanboys. Mm -hmm. And then we have to bend to ultimate reality and we'll drop the price. Actually, Jack Tretton, who's the CEO of PlayStation in the U.S., says the exact same thing. The target consumer already has a PS3. There are 60 million of those people out there. We'd be happy if we sold half a million of these Vitas, oh, in about three weeks. You might say, okay, well, of 60 million people, maybe they're onto something. However, if you think about the Vitas launch in Japan... In in the Japanese market, they've sold about that many Vitas, but the Vita went on sale in December. So I'm not sure why they think that it's going to sell twice as many in 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 such a short amount of time here in the U.S. Okay, we should have him on audio at this All right. point. Uh, real quickly before we move on to talking about ACTA, uh, Paul, what, what, tell us a little bit about what the New Zealand reaction to the launch of the Vita was. Were, were people grousing about the price or were they happy to fork over as many dollars as they had in their pockets? Should. All right. It's not sorry. Um, oh, there we go. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, sorry, I missed a little a little bit of that. Um, you, you're talking about the, the pricing here in New Zealand. Yeah, well, uh, you were at the launch event. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, the, um, yeah it was quite an interesting ev event. They put on a um, an event sort of at a, at a uh, bar-type venue. And you know, I surveyed some of the audience, and certainly those that were real uh, enthusiastic uh, game players are very, very keen about the concept, and there were a few of them that were uh, had already pre-ordered. Uh, but in terms of the broader audience, yeah, it seems that it's not the um, not the gadget that most average sort of gadget buyers are going to uh, going to be picking up here. Uh, very much an enthusiast product. All right, let's move on to ACTA, European Commission. EU's executive branch announced plans to seek an opinion from the European Court of Justice about ACTA's constitutionality in Europe. Now, you might think, oh, well, so they're trying to kill ACTA. They want to get the judge to rule on it. It's actually the opposite. Vivian Redding, the EU Commissioner for Justice, Fundamental Rights and Citizenship, said the EC has decided to ask the European Court of Justice for an opinion to clarify that the ACTA agreement and its implementation must be fully compatible with freedom of expression and freedom of the Internet. The reason for that, according to Commissioner Carol de Gucht, is that, in Carol's words, I believe that putting ACTA before the European Court of Justice is a needed step. This debate must be based upon facts and not upon misinformation or rumor that has dominated social media sites and blogs in recent weeks. ACTA is set to be debated by the European Parliament in June. This ruling by the Justice Court could delay that debate. But it sounds like what the European Commission is trying to do is lower the heightened tone of debate, try to get it away from from the, uh, the sort of very, I don't know what the word is, the, the people are, are very staunch in their opposition or support, depending on what side they are. And they're trying to find some facts that sound reasonable to debate this about. And one of the bigger things about ACTA was that it was originally negotiated in secret, so people were very afraid of what exactly is in this in this act that's going to affect all of us. We should kind of know what's in there. Then it, the, the actual act has changed so much that it seems kind of lost at times. What exactly is still in this thing? And, for, and to get this through the Court of Justice, maybe there'll be a lot clearer to point out, look, that's what the Court of Justice said on the constitutionality, and it'll be a lot clearer to explain to people, okay, this is the way it is or not. And the funny thing is, if this fails, well, then that'll be a totally different argument.
Yeah, it, it's, it's partly clarification, as you're saying, because a lot of things are being bandied about as being enacted that were removed. But it's also to be able to contradict people who say this will restrict Internet freedoms. If the court says... No, according to the European laws that say you can't restrict Internet freedoms, we don't see that this would restrict Internet freedoms. What it will leave out, though, is the knock-on effect on the rest of the world. Remember, this is ACTA isn't just being signed in Europe. It's been signed in New Zealand, right, Paul? It has indeed, yeah. And, and so now New Zealand has to bring all of their copyright laws into accordance with laws that already exist around the world. So it, it changes laws outside of Europe, not just in in Europe, even if it doesn't change anything in Europe. And it means that the laws in Europe have to stay the way they are because people have signed this agreement. And it means the laws in New Zealand have to stay the way they are because they're conforming to ACTA now. You can't decide, hey, you know what? Our country is going to have a, a more limited copyright protection. If you sign on to this act, you're guaranteeing that you're going to keep protection exactly as the treaty requires you to. I think that's one of the things that could get lost in this debate by the European Court of Justice. All right, uh, finishing up with Nokia, uh, int- uh, rumored to be introducing new low-priced smartphones at Mobile World Congress. Mobile World Congress starts February 27th. Uh, according to Reuters, one of the Windows Phone handsets from Nokia set to be announced is a low-cost model called the Lumia 610. Uh, it's a, a low-cost Windows phone with a price of about £100. That's around $157 U.S. Also, the Nokia 803 is a Symbian phone that they would launch. And it would be uh, focusing around its camera, large imaging sensor, 1080p video, according to Pocket Now, and a 4-inch AMOLED screen. Paul, I know you, you say you're following these uh, Nokia phones really closely. Think these rumors sound plausible and good moves by Nokia? Yeah, it, it does very much. Um, you know, I recall hearing from Stephen Elop during CES. You know, he made it very clear that uh, Nokia are going to be moving up and down the chain in terms of the Windows phones that they're releasing. So... It's, you know, they've, they've been very clear publicly that they will have lower cost Windows phones and higher end Windows phones. So, yeah, this, this seems to be uh, pretty much on, on track with, uh, with those things. And, yeah, the, the, there's likely to be a lot of news, I think, you know, over the next week around, uh, around Windows phone and, uh, and obviously the other mobile platforms. A third Windows phone device, the Lumia 719, also rumored to appear at the show. A leaked document at Unwired Review shows the phone's detailed specs pretty much the same as the Lumia 710. And the Lumia 900, which is a U.S.-only phone right now, would become uh, a world phone. Is that that's something you guys are looking forward to in New Zealand, Paul? Yeah, in fact, we just had the uh, we just had a press event uh, last week from, uh, from Nokia for the 710 and the 800, which are uh, landing here next month. And, yeah, I, th- I think there were a few people fairly disappointed that the 900 hadn't been announced at the same time. Uh, but, again, that seems to be in line with uh, Nokia's process of sort of rolling these things out around the world once they can sign the, uh, the appropriate agreements with, uh, with local carriers. You know, that oddball story about the Symbian phone, the Symbian camera phone, it's, it's, I, I, it would not surprise me for Nokia to just, you know, drag out Symbian one more time and go, look, this is this little feature thing we have. It isn't, I don't think they're going to promote it the same way they are with their Windows phone. That's their bread and butter from now on. The, the fact that, that Tango requires, for Windows phone requires less RAM, that makes it a lot easier to get these phones in places where the phones aren't subsidized like the rest of the world because right now you can get Nokia phones pretty cheaply in the United States, which is a big move. But that, that Symbian, Symbian camera phone, I bet it's just going to be this cool little, oh, look, we also have this, and it's probably just going to be sold more like a camera than it would be. A, yeah, a camera first phone, first phone mm-hmm. when you need it. I mean, they did thing. come up with the end gauge, right? That was Nokia. Interesting. So. Yeah, could be. Let's move on to the news fuse. <laughs> HP announced their first quarter 2012 results. Revenue was $30.4 billion. That's 73 cents a share below analysts' estimates of 87 cents per share. Not good news on the shipments either. PC shipments dropped 18% overall. Consumer PC sales were down 25%. Overall, the personal systems group, you've got to become come to know and love them as they almost got spun out from HP at one point. Uh, revenue for the PSG declined 15% year over year. Printers didn't help either. Uh, that's usually a cash cow for HP. Revenue down in printer section, 7% compared to the first quarter of 2011. So rough quarter for Meg. It's all those paperless offices. We're killing <laughs> HP. that iPad. Amazon, Apple, Google, Microsoft, HP, and RIM have agreed to ask developers to include privacy policies 
in their mobile apps. The agreement is thanks to the California Attorney General who announced the deal today. Failure, failure to comply means that devs may run afoul of California's unfair competition law and or false advertising law. Apple and ProView went to an ice cream social today. Um, wait, no. They went to a court hearing to discuss <laughs> iPad. They, they, there was no ice cream sandwiches involved. Apple argued that its iPad is so popular that, quote, we have to consider the public good. ProView's argument was simple. The court must rule according to the law. The AP reports that the judge had to admonish both sides because they ref- because both sides refused to adhere to court etiquette. They were arguing with each other. <laughs> the name of- I stole is so popular, you can't take it away from me. That's a horrible good. argument. Well, it was, that was one part of it. That was the silliest one. Adobe's outlined its 2012 roadmap for Flash. Version 11.2 is supposed to have better GPU acceleration, multi-threaded video decoding, and support for right clicks. Uh, And if you're on Linux, you'll be able to get it via the Chrome browser, and that's pretty much the only way you're going to be able to get it. Adobe is working with Google to replace a Netscape Netscape plugin API. Uh, Adobe also says to expect a major update in 2013 with Flash Next. No, no talk of retiring Flash this time. Flash next. Flash last. <laughs> <laughs> Flash still alive. Who's going to use it? <laughs> Flash yeah, exactly. creaky bones. iPhoneIslam.com found a flaw in iOS 5.0.1 that could compromise data even on a passcode protected phone. In a video that demoed the flaw, the phone would have to have missed a call notifier that was visible on the lock screen. So that's step number one. As the attacker tries to unlock the phone via the notification to place a call back, the SIM card would be ejected. Those steps need to be done repeatedly before the iPhone will allow access to call history and the phone app. So sort of a difficult workaround, but bad if somebody phone? ends up. Can I borrow oh. your phone for like three minutes? I think you probably have a better chance of like your screen uh, smashing. Uh, do you have a paperclip? <laughs> <laughs> Can I see your phone? I need a paperclip. In an interview with Apple Insider, a project officer for the Students and Scholars Against Corporate Misbehavior claims that Foxconn reassigned underage employees to avoid them being discovered by the Fair Labor Association inspections. Underage workers in this case refers to those between 16 and 17 years of age. They were told not to work overtime, and some were actually transferred to other departments. Jonathan Norman published code called PC Anywhere Nuke that could be used to crash Symantec's PC Anywhere. Norman is the director of security research at Alert Logic and said this is the first of a bunch of flaws he found. The PC Anywhere Nuke code should work on even patched installations of the PC Anywhere software. Don't forget that PC Anywhere is the one that had its source code leaked. Symantec told PC World that it is investigating these claims. One would hope they are. According to Cyclo Semiconductor, it is licensing its resident clock mesh technology to AMD. That should mean that AMD's pile driver based processors will be capable of speeds over 4 gigahertz. Resident clock mesh tech recycles clock power instead of letting it dissipate. AMD's new processors are expected later this year. The Wall Street Journal found a Google filing asking for permission to be a video service in Kansas City, Missouri. The video service would piggyback on Google's high-speed network that is currently building out in the city. The journal sources also say that the service could launch as soon as a month or two from now. Rumored content partners include Time Warner, Disney, and Discovery. Jason, spin up the randomizer. Randomizer. It's spinning. Gizmodo reports Japan will have a space elevator by 2050. And I will be there, mm-hmm. 80 years old, being denied entry because I'm too old. But I'm very excited about this. According to the Daily Yomiuri, uh, construction company Obayashi Corp has announced it will build a space elevator capable of shuttling passengers 36,000 kilometers above the Earth. And they hope to be done by 2050. Who's in? Who's into the space elevator? I hope to still be alive by then. So I am in. If they'll have me. I'd like to go to this, but the thing is it's a week and you're stuck together for one week. I hope this elevator is very large. It takes a week to get up or two weeks then? It's 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 a a long trip. It's a round trip, I think. It's a a round trip. One week? Okay. Two 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 weeks is a little much. Also, you know. That's what the elevator's for. Come on. What if the elevator's out? Like I've been in buildings where there's only one, right? Like do you have Mm -hmm. to like take the stairs? Yeah. Are you waiting for like a week? (laughs) Waiting for the next one? I hope they have a better reservation system for an elevator. Probably easier to go with uh, Virgin Galactic, I would think, if you want to get up to space, surely. Yeah, if you're just going to go up and come right back down. Of course, that's mm-hmm. the vomit. Yeah, comet. what's this elevator ride price? Is it like Empire State Building price or is it like Virgin Galactic price? Well, the Empire State Building, let's roughly guess what, a kilometer or two tall? 
So just yeah. uh, 18,000 times the price of an Empire State Building. We carry up to 30 people in <laughs> seven and a half days. We'll probably all be making that, you know, hourly rate, right? Put a dollar in the bank now. <laughs> <laughs> You'll get your elevator ride to space. Let's check the calendar. The Samsung Galaxy S Blaze 4G, say that three times fast, is coming to T-Mobile stores in March for $150 on contract. Um, It sports Android 2.3, yeah. Uh, A 1.5 gigahertz dual-core Snapdragon processor, 5 megapixel rear cam, and there's some decent specs, so I'll let you make your your choices about that. Apple says, hey, developers, you now have until June 1st to sandbox your apps for the Mac App Store. Previously, the deadline which mar- was March 1st. Sandboxing will limit resources that apps can access. This is supposed to be um, good for less malware in app stores, but devs don't tend to like it because it gives their apps less control overall, and it can be kind of buggy to, to sandbox. And finally, Mozilla will begin accepting submissions from app developers for the Mozilla Marketplace at Mobile World Congress next week. Apps will run across all HTML5 browsers and OSs, so it's not just for Firefox users, it's potentially for all of us. The store will open for consumers later this year. What's that I hear, Jason? Incoming message. Oh, it is an incoming message. From Paul in Reading, Pennsylvania, who says, Guys and gal... I was listening to the February 21st edition of Tech News Today, and you talked about the rumor of Microsoft Office for the iPad. The only way I see this happening is if it is tied into Microsoft SkyDrive. Mm, interesting. And it is limited to what you can do with the web-based product. In fact, it would not surprise me if it is the web-based version, that's Office 365, optimized for tablets so that it can work on both the iPad and Android tablets. If Microsoft could do that, it would be a big punch in the gut to Google. Take that, well, Google. they certainly want to do that. You should listen to Paul, Microsoft. The thing is, when they came out with their office, with their web-based office, they it, they excluded iOS and Android. So it seems a little silly. Oh, now we're going to change our mind that way instead of doing a native app. Because one of the big things, one of their big punches against Google is you can't do that offline, can you? They they've mocked Google for that. But and, uh, but the Office three sixty five is the right. He's got the right idea, which is that's tied into Microsoft Office. Mm-hmm. So to use it on the iPad you would need to eventually use Microsoft Office and you'd be able to use it offline. So it, it, would, it would be everything and more than well, what Google According offers. to Microsoft's official corporate communications Twitter, they said, great, they're discussing the daily, that they, 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 they reported that they had the iPad app for uh, Office for iPad. It says, it's regrettable someone is giving them bad info and that it'll be clear in the coming weeks. Yeah, so that's so, an official tweet basically saying you're going to see that the daily is wrong. I, I oh. Well, they say great respect for the daily. And, and what they mean, according to Mary Jo Foley, who uh-huh. parsed all this, is this is not the final version, and we will announce the final version in the next few weeks. <laughs> so there you go. So we'll find out in a couple of weeks. Well, that's what we said yesterday, though. Yeah. But, it, but, it, but for Microsoft to go to such lengths to be like, the daily really doesn't know what they're talking about, they better have an app that looks pretty different. That's typical Microsoft. Yeah. Right? Be blue. Next email from Ed Hillman in Virginia. Hi, guys. In TNT 441, you had a story about how the electrical grid could be taken out by online attacks. It would take a massive coordinated attack by a large number of people because there's no electrical grid in the U.S. What exists is a large number of local, state, and regional electrical grids, of which some, but not all, are linked together. The powers that be have been using the propaganda scare tactic of attacks against the electrical grid grid for several years since now they know that very few people know or understand how it really works. While there may be some electrical grids operated and maintained by state and or local governments, the vast majority are owned by private companies. Many are publicly traded. The U.S. government does not own, doesn't maintain, doesn't operate any electrical grids whatsoever. Good. Uh, those are all good points, Ed. Uh, there's probably exceptions to what you're saying as far as the Army goes, but but for all intents and purposes, you're absolutely right. The U.S. government doesn't own or maintain them, but they do rely on them. Yeah. So it is in their interest to protect them. Well, and uh, private companies can be attacked. And private companies like can be attacked. Can. I think, but, but the point he makes is a good one. You can't take down the entire U.S. grid at once because it's not a grid. Mm-hmm. You can take down parts of it. That's why we've seen like blackouts in the Northeast, et cetera. And that's really what they're talking about. I still agree with you, Ed, that they're they're sort of blow overblowing the fears in some of these warnings. But I also think that there's a real issue with the security of the various interlocking grids that needs to be addressed. But thanks for the email. Good good points. Paul, so sorry we had such uh, issues with the connection. Uh, we'll definitely try to figure it out and get you back on again when we can see you. Uh, but thanks again for, for joining us. Let folks know where they can find you online. Yeah, they can find me uh, on Twitter is just Paul Spain and also website is paulspain.com. 
uh, if they're wanting to, if they're from New Zealand, want to look up the New Zealand Tech Podcast, we're just nztechpodcast.com. Don't forget, you can submit stories at our Reddit. Our subreddit is technewstoday.reddit.com. Get in there and vote on what stories you want to hear us talk about on Tech News Today. And that's it for us. We are on the web at twit.tv slash TNT. You can find us on the emails at TNT at twit.tv. And if you want to pick up the little dialy thingy with the push buttons and give us a phone call, our number is 260-TNT-SHOW. Brian Brushwood, the guy with the spiky hair, joins us tomorrow. See you then.